So I just finished watching Intervention. It's my favorite show on TV. It's pretty much the only show I watch on TV. Anything that's reality, I just don't like made up things. And I've been sober for about 13 years. And even this guy on Intervention, he was, you know, he was drinking a gallon of vodka every day. I've never seen anything like it. And he was on all these painkillers too. And he had like 15 bottles of prescriptions in his room. And he was always articulate. The only thing that was obvious about him using so much was his withdrawals in the morning, his seizures and uh, sweating profusely. But at least he had a friend. And his friend came over and would check on him, make sure that he was okay and he would help clean his house and stuff like that. And I was thinking about how I don't even I mean, I haven't had a friend since I got sober in 2008. And so I guess there's some underlying issues with what's going on with me. It's not just alcohol. That was just a band-aid for what was going on deep inside of me. I just, I've always had really low self-esteem and self-worth issues ever since I was a little boy. Very sensitive to my surroundings. My dad was strict. He scared me with his anger, his rage. And so I, I just started rocking back and forth as a boy. Um, they call that stimming in the Asperger's community or autism community. And, um, and then music was my best friend growing up. But I always had one or two really good friends growing up and growing up. And I'm not complaining, my childhood was great. You know, uh, some of my teachers were mean. They, you know, I've actually been hit by a couple of my teachers growing up. And uh, my dad hit me a couple times. And, you know, there was bullies in school, but nothing, you know, it was a small, safe town. And I grew up in a middle class family. Nothing too scary, nothing out of the normal. And, uh, you know, my parents didn't even drink. They, uh, they wanted to you know, provide a safe environment for my sister and I, and they didn't drink because their, their parents drank and they didn't want to be like their parents. Um, so I guess I started drinking when I was 17 and I was, you know, I, I started really slow. I was kind of scared of it. I didn't know the potential of it or how powerful it was. Uh, so I'd only have a couple beers at a time, but I loved it. Once that bu that buzz hit me, uh, I just felt immortal. And I thought that was, it was my magic potion. You know, it took all my concerns away. I felt free, uninhibited. I could talk to anyone and I had unlimited energy. It felt like the whole world opened up and I had only one day to live and tell everyone about it. That's how alcohol felt in the early days. And I still had friends, you know, and then when I was 20, um, I started dating an older woman and she was an artist and um, I was a, a poet, so-called, you know, wannabe poet. and. Um, she really liked my poetry and she invited me over and we started drinking wine together and then I just I just lived with her and I started to get rid of my old friends because they were like jocks and uh, you know they just weren't uh, they weren't privy to the art world and they weren't art they weren't artsy and you know they didn't they didn't read books they didn't do art you know or anything like that so I started getting rid of my jock friends and then got rid of my stoner friends and all I had la left was pretty much this older woman. So I started drinking heavy with her and, and then started drinking heavy with all my girlfriends and uh, towards the end of my drinking, when I was 36, I was just hanging out with homeless people that lived next door to me and I, you know, I was really in bad shape. I was getting drunk twice a day drinking malt liquor and uh, you know had no life and that was 2008 and I, I had maybe one friend and he was like dude you're gonna die in a year if you don't stop that was pretty much my intervention that's not what made me stop but after when I got sober I had to get rid of everything that reminded me of my past so I got rid of all the drinking friends I got rid of 
all the triggers you know the old places where i used to drink bars everywhere i i just would not go anywhere i just hid behind my work and i picked up two jobs i was working from morning until night in the restaurant industry and um for for pleasure i would just you know eat m m's and um I had a heart attack a couple years earlier than that, and so they gave me Xanax. So I would, I would pop a couple of Xanax and smoke a little weed and smoke my cigarettes and eat candy bars, and that was the beginning of my sobriety. And then finally, I quit all those things. But the friends never came back. Um, I still have a girlfriend today. That's that's not an issue. I, I've always had, you know, a, a girl by my side but the friends are hard to come by um especially with this lockdown you know and i've had a couple friends over the years on the internet when i was doing affiliate marketing or internet marketing or um you know blogging i met a couple blogging friends and we'd talk about our blogs and what we were doing with them and how how we were getting them ranked and stuff like that but you know, and then I had probably a dozen people that I talked to when I was in network marketing. But there was never any really close bond, not like my childhood. So I always look up to, I always, I really like movies where there's camaraderie between guys. You know, I never had an older brother. And so I, I just like the guy, you know, I like, I like those guy movies where they, you know, I even like monastery movies. I like real stuff. That's just part of my Asperger's. I, I hate fiction. So my two favorite types of niches to get this male camaraderie from is prison documentaries and monasteries where they're all guys. And I have nothing against women, but I do miss having good guy friends. And there's something about the routine in prison and in monasteries that I really, I'm really drawn to that. Um, because people with Asperger's, they, they like, they like structure, they like routine, and they like to do things a certain way. In fact, that's what made me realize that my dad probably had Asperger's and I, I have it too. It's hereditary. And my dad was a perfectionist, and what he put his mind to, he, he accomplished a lot. But he would always just hide in his workshop working on his cars. He restored cars for fun after he retired from owning a couple businesses around town. And he was really good at what he did. Uh, he restored several beautiful cars. I mean, we're talking a uh, Porsche 356 Speedster, a MGTC and a Jaguar, I think a XL or something like that. Beautiful, he does everything, the welding, the paint job, uh, the, the parts, you know, he has like a metal lathe. And so, but growing up, there was a lot of structure in our house. We had dinner exactly at 6 p.m. every night. We had breakfast exactly at 7 a.m. every morning. And um, he liked a quiet, uh, structured household and Sunday was family days so I can go play with friends and when I was 16 we butted heads because we were a lot alike and so um, I gave him the silent treatment because that was the only defense I had that was the only weapon I knew of is to withholding love so um, from 16 to 18 didn't talk to my dad my mom cried to me pleading to talk to my dad you're killing your father you got to talk to him i didn't and then he kicked me out when i was 18 and so last couple years i've you know i made amends with my dad when i was 25 that was like 15 years ago but i still have regret that i hurt him i still have regret that um we couldn't get along you know i we couldn't get along we butted heads, he was strict, I didn't want to follow his rules, and that was the dynamic. So I got this weird thing with my dad, you know, I want to still please him, 
I want him to be proud of me. And, you know, he went to counseling when I, when I disappeared when I was 20, started dating that older woman. I only lived like two blocks away from their house, my parents' house. They didn't know where I lived for like two years. I ignored them and had a lot of rage, you know? It, it was eating me alive. And so even today, I'm just like, Dad, I love you. I'm, you know, I, I'm sorry. And he's like, he's like, you don't have to, you don't have to apologize. I'm proud of you. And it doesn't sink home that he's proud of me. So. I guess it's a my self-worth issue. I have to revisit that. And I guess I just, I guess I need some friends. Um, or I don't even, I don't even want friends most of the time. I, I get irritated when people talk too much to me or they talk about stuff that I'm not interested in. So I, I have a, like a real selective attention span. You know, but if you talk about certain things, I light up. I'm just like, yeah, you know. So I guess my interests are, you know, Asperger's, uh, sobriety, uh, the mon the monastic lifestyle, or even prison. You know, if you're <laughs> if you're an ex felon, hit me up. No, I don't know. You guys know what I'm talking about. I mean, do you miss, you know? Did you ever have an older brother? Do you miss your older brother? Do you have a younger brother? Do you miss them? You know, you guys keep in touch or how are you doing with your dad? You know, you get along with your dad. Did you ever forg forgive your dad or forgive yourself? And before he died, is he, is he still alive? My dad's gonna be 80 next year and he wants to come see me. We're in Texas now and he's in Washington State. I don't want to go back to my small town. I got too many bad memories there from drinking, being the town drunk, and uh, don't want to see any of my old friends. And since I quit high school, I, I, didn't, I have never gone to any high school reunion or anything. And I guess I was a punk, you know? I. I was rebellious and did drugs and alcohol and my role models were punks and they were negative, they were drunks. Well, I wouldn't say Hemingway was a punk, but you know, he took his own life so I guess that's very selfish to commit suicide. I would never do that. I'm not suicidal. I guess that's one good thing to be proud about. Never been suicidal. Um, but. I'm almost 50 and sometimes when I wake up from a nap I get this mini life review and I feel really empty like I did nothing with my life the only thing I did was throw a big tantrum in my life and I became a drunk and I tried art and I tried college eventually and I tried merchant marines quit that tried modeling, quit that, you know, it seems like most of the stuff I've done, I've quit. But I am very proud of my sobriety. And I got 13 years, had a couple two-day relapses in the beginning, but I'm not counting those. I'm not starting my clock over. If I did start my clock over, it'd probably be 10 years, 11 years of sobriety. Still really freaking good. I got that, because I don't want to die. I don't want to, I don't want to just, I would be homeless. I would be hanging out with the bums and the homeless guys because that's what I did at the last couple years of drinking. I hung out with the homeless guys because they drank like me and they were humbled. They're beaten, they're beaten down by life. And, and to me that equated to egoless. They didn't pick on me because they were, they were always hung over down on their luck, poor, and their dads were mean to them. You know, I used to hang out with the, without the, I used to hang out with these guys next door. And at first it was fun because I was, I was a writer and I wanted to do research on them. I was always interested in abnormal psychology and hung out with them. And then pretty soon I became one of them. And those guys are dead. They died a long time ago, 10, 15 years ago. 
um, and I'm still here. And I think the only reason I'm here is to to help somebody either find God or get sober. But I'm really having a dilemma with, you know, I guess loneliness and wanting that connection with, you know, some guys. You remember how good it was in childhood? Or you can just laugh so hard you almost pee your pants. Or you laugh so hard that you can't even, all the, all the wind gets knocked out of you, you laugh so hard. I did that one time um, on LSD, actually. A guy, ran th a guy ran in front of me and then he dashed in, f in behind a bush and it looked like he disappeared. And it was the most hilarious thing in, in the world. I laughed so hard it just instantly knocked all the wind out of me. I was like this. I mean, I almost suffocated. I, I just laughed so hard. And, and working in the restaurant business from 16 to 30, 35, I, I met a lot of cool guys, you know, that just, they were hilarious. And uh, I, was, I, was always, I always felt proud of myself if I could make them laugh, but they made me laugh constantly. I was never a leader in groups. I was always kind of like, like my best friend, I always called him Fred and I was Barney. I was like, I was always a sidekick with people. But you get me with a really funny alpha male and I compliment them very well. You know, we, we can just spin jokes off of each other all day long, make funny little noises, try to make up our own little foreign languages, do funny stuff, sing stupid 80s songs and screw them up. You know, I've seen it all in the restaurant business. And now, you know, I've been working from home since 2016. It's just me and my fiance, and I watch a couple documentaries that remind me how fun it is to hang out with guys. So I guess that's my, my story today. Uh, leave a comment, you know, if, if you can relate to any of this, you know, leave a comment and we'll continue this conversation later. Have a good day.